Hey everybody, welcome or welcome back to the Kitchen Invitation Podcast. No song intro today, I just want to make sure I get this episode out there. I am recording Parker Sue Holden's birth story today. She is one month old and a couple days, and I'm excited to share my experience at the hospital with you all. I'm going to be reading the notes I took while I was at the hospital, so we're here's hoping I took some decent notes. And before I get into her birth story, which I know is a little outside of my general topics, however, a lot of people really liked when I shared Lincoln's birth story, so I'm going to do the same because... I feel like it, right? And no, she wasn't born in a kitchen. She was born at the hospital at 2.14 a.m. And let me tell you, she came into the world fast and furiously. Okay, we'll get to that in just a moment. First, I want to say thank you so much to anybody in my Patreon cooking community and to some of the people who have recently joined that community. Every single month, I do cooking classes. I share Um, from the pantry guides and meal ideas, at least 10 meal ideas from a common thing you'll find in the pantry. I share meal plans, solve more cooking dilemmas, help you basically achieve your cooking goals. So be sure to check that out. It's in the show notes. Links are on my website as well, thekitcheninvitation.com. And honestly, I just thank you again so much to those who have joined. My goal is to hit 100 people in that group this year so that I can do more cooking classes, have a better even filming setup. So if you're on the fence, I highly recommend you check it out. And if there's something you want to learn about with cooking, a specific dilemma you're facing, please just send me a message and let me know. I am an open book. My emails are open. My DMs are open. I want to help you. The cost of the Patreon group is $5 for general support and lots of handouts and, you know, weekly inspiration in the kitchen. And it is $10 a month for the additional um, cooking class. So, you know, a registered dietitian for 10 bucks a month is obscenely low in cost. I don't mind saying that because I know it's a great deal. I'm excited about where it's going. So just go check it out. Do me a favor. Go check it out. Okay. All right. Enough of the infomercial. I'm going to get into Parker's birth story. All right. So we scheduled an induction. This was something I did not want to do. (laughs) I won't lie. I, I hit 40 weeks and at that point they had offered an induction and just said like, hey, you're at 40 weeks, it's your due date. Um, I think I had my 40 week appointment like the day prior. So on 40 weeks, they called me and they said, hey, you can come and get induced right now. And I was just like, ah, I'm not even gonna answer the phone. And I didn't, I let them leave a voicemail because I knew they were gonna offer it. And I just, I just felt like I wasn't ready. I went all the way to 41 weeks with my son Lincoln. My water had broken at home. And I did have hopes of that happening again. You know, I think it's a mix of the fearful things we read online and just some other people's past experiences. Even though I had plenty of friends who have had wonderful experiences with inductions, I don't know. I had this thought that like, no, I need to wait. And that's okay. I was glad I did. However, I got closer and closer to the 41 week mark and I had been offered let's see two inductions after her due date one and I just eventually told them you know no I want to be off of this list I will call if I want to do this and then I called (laughs) because I talked to my doctor some more and we agreed like that maybe my body was just needing a little nudge her fluids were looking good. She was measuring small. I measured small throughout the whole pregnancy. Um, although, you know, she still came out eight pounds. So that's my thought on that. <laughs> um, so I did opt for a scheduled induction. Um, I guess they called it a medical induction at that point because I was actually at 41 weeks the day I was at the hospital or went to the hospital. Um, and, you know, I tried to just be at peace with it because it wasn't worth it in my head fighting it anymore and I was so uncomfortable and in a lot of pain that it was just time so 7 30 a.m 
we went to the hospital. We um, dropped my son off at my mom's house the night prior, which that felt really good, at least to get him settled. Um, he snuggled me and we read a book and I sang his songs that he loves. And I swear he knew something was coming. And I was just like a, a sobbing mess because <laughs> it was like my last night with just my baby boy. So that was emotional and the transition has been great. But man, that night, that was tough. Okay, back to the hospital. We were admitted and right away I loved the nurse that um, I met. Um, unfortunately, she was not the one who was there with me throughout the whole day. We'll get to that. But she was fantastic. We did a cervical check. Um, I was one centimeter, 20% effaced, which was different than what my doctor had said. So that was kind of interesting to me. Um, however, she looked at me and she said, whoa, you're measuring like baby girls like way up high and she was pretty sure she was lying transverse which is funny because I had two ultrasounds to confirm she was head down because like literally every other appointment people were like mm, she's head down mm, no she's not mm, she's head down no she's not so right when I got there they thought she was lying transverse so the nurse um filled a hospital like glove with ice and then got me a heat pack and put the heat pack low and the ice up high where she thought her head was. And this got baby turning away from the cold, which I just thought was hilarious and a really, you know, just kind of low intervention. It's not hard to have ice on your stomach and heat down low. Um, so I thought that was funny and they were pretty sure that's what got her head down. And we did an ultrasound then to confirm and I talked to the attending physician. We went over, you know, the birth like ideal plans that I had in my mind. Steve really helped me remember some of the things I wanted to bring up that even if I felt confident about them ahead of time, in the moments of just being there, it's very hard for me to speak my mind about those wishes. I don't know why but it is. And so Steve did a great job championing, championing, cha championing <laughs> that for me. Um, so major kudos to him. So we um, opted to start with Cytotec, which was a medicine inserted in me to help ripen the cervix, which now the word ripen is like destroyed for me. I hate that word. Um, so again, we talked with the attending physician. He also gave me compliments that I had a really large placenta and that everything looked healthy. So win for me. <laughs> um, I had some blood drawn. We wanted to see where my um, platelets were at. Those were starting to drop last time and I had really struggled with a blood loss and iron labs, everything last time. So I was trying to be very proactive about that. Um, the med was placed. I had to be on bed rest for an hour. Um, and then in that time, we just we just kind of chilled. We turned on the TV and we watched Law and Order, much like we had been doing every night before the induction. <laughs> um, so we ordered some lunch. It took like an hour and 45 minutes to get there. <laughs> It was awful. Um, we were. I was starting to feel kind of antsy. Um, during this time, the nurse I had that I really liked had come in a lot and she would check in with me and just kind of sit and talk with us, go through everything. She was wonderful. And then she got pulled because there was somebody else who was there who was going to have a C-section. And, you know, that's completely appropriate and fine. It just bummed me out because I really liked her. So... Um, at 1.20 in the afternoon, we have finally now eaten lunch. The doctor came in to recheck things and see where I was at, and I had made no progress. Sorry, that was my phone. <laughs> I had made no progress. I did feel kind of discouraged. Um, we did another dose of the med to see if we could make some progress. So then after I had, you know, did some bed rest with it, um, I was able to get up. We took lots of walks around the hospital floor. Um, and then I was starting to get contractions often and starting to get uncomfortable, but I was, you know, still able to walk, stretch, move. I was just bored. I didn't bring my computer. I didn't bring a book. We had the TV and I had my phone, but there's only so long you can stare and scroll on your phone before you start going crazy, right? So, um, by four o'clock, I realized that, like, I hadn't seen a nurse since quarter to two, which is probably not like uncommon because I was pretty low needs. It just felt weird because the first nurse was coming in like often, which even if nothing was technically happening, 
it just made me feel like things were progressing and happening. So it was more of like a mental check for me, which I do realize I could have had our new nurse come in, um, but she just wasn't as, um, you know, she just didn't jive with my vibe <laughs> as well. Um, so that's okay. You know, I just, I was a little nervous because um, she kept having other people come in to help her, which is great. She needs to learn, um, but it just wasn't the experience or the person that like I was feeling the most comfortable with. But since nothing again was like super progressing too fast, I was, you know, pretty confident we'd get to a new night nurse and then I'd see who that was. And if I didn't drive with them, I would probably off like ask to switch just to make sure I had somebody that I really um, could talk with and felt comfortable with. Right. So we called for the nurse at like 415. I wanted a yoga ball, which if I, I think I shared this in Lincoln's birth story, we were like traumatized by the yoga ball because the only way we could get him to go to sleep sometimes <laughs> would be for bouncing on a ball. And I don't mean bouncing on a ball for a couple seconds. I mean like sometimes 10 to 20 minutes at a time and you're back you think you can handle it you can't it's awful so I was surprised that I was ready to get it on a yoga ball but um, at this point you know like I said it's like 4 15 4 30 I was having contractions every one to three minutes um, the nurse could see that my stomach was tightening they weren't incredibly painful by any means but they were not tracking on their monitors and this is probably because I kept getting up and moving and I just had one of the monitors that like they strap on with the gel which my skin sensitive anyway so I, I just I don't love those and we were waiting for the next cervical check so I got back in bed again just to see if they could track my contractions but anytime you have one for me it's not like the most comfortable to just lay there I like to be sitting up and like I was hanging on to a comb and kind of running the the comb against my hand that's kind of interesting so nothing was happening <laughs> So we did another dose of Cytotech at quarter to 6 p.m. Um, maybe they thought another half or one centimeter I was dilated. There was no effacement. And I was near tears at this point because, you know, this was starting to feel like a little bit of the stories I heard about inductions were nothing, nothing, nothing. And then they start pushing things. Nobody was pushing anything on me. It just it just felt discouraging to be there and like felt like we weren't getting checked on. I felt like I was alone, even though Steve was right there. Um, but then things started to change. So around 7.30 o'clock in the evening, we got our new nurse and I really, really liked her. Um, she said she is a let's get it done person, but not like a, I'm going to force you into anything. You know, they had offered me options like even the balloon and I just said, nope, I don't want that. And they were completely fine with it. So um, I'm pretty sure the next med we had planned on doing was Cervidel. Um, and they said it was kind of like a tampon and that I could rest and kind of do this overnight. It stays in for 12 hours or less, but it could really help nudge me and nudge my body into thinking like, hey, let's take over. We know how to do this because I had done it before. Um, so at eight o'clock, because I had told the nurse like, hey, I'm still getting contractions like almost every minute. <laughs> she wasn't able to see them, but she said, let's get you on a wireless monitor, which did end up like showing my contractions beautifully and how aggressive they were starting to become um, because they were never spaced out. They were every single minute, but they weren't terrible, right? I just kept saying like, they're not bad. I know they're going to get worse. I know, you know, this isn't that bad. Even if I had to kind of start concentrating when I got them. So um, the only bad thing about that wireless monitor for me is, again, as I said, my skin is sensitive. So after they took that off of me, I had four like burn marks around my stomach that took quite a while to heal, like a couple weeks of postpartum until those were like gone and healed. I just blame my sensitive skin for that one. So um, once they saw that my contractions were that close together, we started an IV of just fluids at nine o'clock and then they started spacing out a little bit. And then at 9.15, we did a cervical check. I was three centimeters, contractions are starting to get a little more painful. But again, I'm three centimeters. So in my head, I'm like, I got a ways to go. So we opted to just let my body do its thing. You know, we didn't want to do any other interventions. Um, I was GBS positive, so we knew we were going to do um, penicillin at some point, but we were just going to opt to see if my body was starting to kick in and, and do, do what it was going to do. I slept until about midnight and they came in and checked me. So 
and I was still at three centimeters at that point, you know, about three hours later. At this point, I was, you know, still um, getting contractions and they were starting to get worse. So we did do a little bit of Pitocin and got the penicillin started. Okay, so here's where things get interesting. <laughs> Around 1.15, I am feeling a lot of things. And I mean, between 12, I want to say it was 12.30 a.m. when they said you're still at three centimeters, let's start Pitocin. We barely start Pitocin and I'm starting to feel like these are aggressive. I'm starting to say things like this isn't fair, this hurts. Um, I'm starting to not be able to communicate in between um, contractions because they were just every freaking minute. So finally, I, you know, and in hindsight, I wish I had asked for pain relief before, but I had said around 1.15, 1 1.30 a.m. I said, you know what, like to my nurse, I said, I think I'm ready for some pain relief. Like I, I just, I kind of, I just, I don't know, I need something. And I said, why don't we just do the, um, the med that makes me feel drunk and not care about these as much. But at this point, I'm like sitting on the edge of the bed because I, I couldn't get up. I wanted to, but I also just felt like I couldn't. I'm starting to have such a hard time. I'm like trying to like cry hum through the contractions <laughs> and she, you know, and I'm starting to get nauseous too, which again, in my head, I'm three centimeters. So even though it felt like way worse than where I had gotten with contractions <laughs> with my son Lincoln, because I want to say with him, I got an epidural around six or seven centimeters. Um, and she, you know, the nurse came back in with the drug, but when she saw me and I was like near vomiting into a bag, she said, why don't we just call Dr. Foster? You said you wanted an epidural. Like, what do you think? I just want to make sure you have that on the option table. She was not pushy. She just, you know, said, let's consider it. And I said, you know what? This sucks. Yes. Let's just do it. Um, I'm glad that we did get the epidural because, while she um, had told me I needed to tell her if I felt like pressure to push, I kind of kept it to myself, which, you know, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing. I don't know. But here comes Dr. Foster, the anesthesiologist. He was funny. I met him earlier because I had said I'd like to talk to them ahead of time. Um, I knew I wanted the epidural, but last time I was so numb, like I felt nothing that, you know, I was pushing for 45 minutes, which wasn't terrible, but it only wasn't terrible because I couldn't feel anything. So I don't know if I was ever pushing well, I tore really bad. So I, I had said like, is there a way to do the epidural? But like, I still want to feel like I know what my body's doing. I just don't want to be in so much pain. And he was like, yeah, you know, it depends on placement. It depends on dosage and blah, blah, blah. So we had a really good conversation about that. And if you remember last time, my epidural had fallen out. So his suspicion is that by the time they came back, because I was so close to pushing and I was feeling everything again, they might have just like bumped me with a really high dose or, you know, that was just how my body took to it last time. So... Um, as he is like placing it, I am starting to, again, kind of scream through these. I'm kind of crying. At this point, I felt like I couldn't get on top of the contractions. I knew breathing would help. I knew staying calm would help, but I was just really struggling to do any of those things. So, um, as he is like near finishing because I'm about vomiting, I'm, I'm starting to like get really loud. I think Steve's getting freaked out. Uh, my nurse is starting to look at me like things are happening. <laughs> this is this seems to be progressing. But when you're getting the epidural, you just have to sit there. You can't move. So I didn't want to mess with that and screw up something. But as soon as he was done, because I had said, like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. I can't do this. Um, I, I screamed at her because she, she had told me like, Hey, you got to tell me if you feel the pressure to push as soon as he was done, like slapping tape on my back. I just said like, I have to push, I have to push right now. I don't want to do this. And I flew onto my back onto the bed, which I didn't want to do. And I said, my water broke. And she said, no, I don't. And she, she said she's checked, but she said, no, I don't think so. And I'm like, no, I guarantee it broke. And just because of the way it had, like I had shifted and flown back onto the bed it, it just didn't like register yet and then all of a sudden I felt my body pushing for me and I and then my water really really broke and she starts screaming down the hallway to get people to run into the room 
And this is where it gets a little blurry for me. And I want to say it lasted like I'm going to assume 45 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe two. It just felt so fast. Um, what was unfortunate is that I really wanted to push on my side. I had told everybody this like so many times and I wish like even though things were happening so quickly, I wish someone had like helped me think about that. I understand like it was just fast and even in my head, the only thing I was like concentrating on was like the pain. Unfortunately, I couldn't get my head out of there for a little bit. And I looked at the anesthesiologist and I said, why is the epidural not working? I don't want to feel this. Mind you, the epidural got placed like 30 seconds before this. Um, so I'm on my back, which again, I didn't want to be, but say la vie, this is what happened. Um, finally, like, I think I heard one clear voice because there were so many people like yelling at me. And if I could ever give them feedback, I know they're probably communicating and doing all kinds of things. But to me, it was so overwhelming having like what felt like eight people yelling different things at me and I could not hear anybody. Um, I definitely felt her head and I was like, OK, this is happening. And I kind of snapped out of my pain and went into I have to push her out and there's I don't have a choice. I will say this is kind of funny. I know through the like loudness of everybody telling me things they kept saying you can do this and I think I yelled out I know I can but I don't want to <laughs> so Steve thought that was really funny I was like I know I can do it I just I don't want to do this um so honestly two pushes and she and me screaming um she flew out um, at that time they had told me I had a third degree tear but my notes in my chart say second degree and I'm healing mostly faster so I'm not sure I'll talk to the doctor about that one and again I was a little disappointed because laying on your side is said to reduce like the risk of tearing but again I'm not angry about it because it's just not worth it to me to hold on to the anger I have grieved it and I have worked through it and I'm I'm past it already which that feels good um she was out though she went right to my chest and that felt really awesome I did, like, as soon as I was done with that, I was like, wow, I'm a badass. Like, I I did that basically without any pain med because it wasn't until afterwards um, when I was delivering, like, the placenta and everything else uh, that, that the epidural had started to kick in. But what was so nice about it, and this is what I would have wanted from the epidural, I could move my legs right away. I would have been able to birth on my side, do what I wanted to do, because I could move, but I just couldn't feel anything like right down there. It was like beautifully, perfectly numb. Dr. Foster, you were a rock star. You did what I wanted. I just didn't ask for it soon enough. <laughs> so I told them not to touch me or stitch me or anything until the epidural had kicked in. Um, but, you know, we did a lot of skin to skin right when she was born. Steve and I just sat there like happy and I was it was, it's such, it's so odd to me. I just feel like I was talking normally to everybody, even though I had just been through something so crazy in my head. I felt so proud of myself and everyone's like, you did so great. And they're just like leaving the room and I'm like, yeah, okay, thanks. Like, this is really awesome. And I don't know. It just, it's a very odd experience. So, uh, let's see. She started breastfeeding right away, which was really cool. I will say her latch wasn't great right away, but I don't know, maybe nobody's is right away and you're laying pretty much on your back and that doesn't feel like an ideal position to me. I know so many people do the laid back breastfeeding position, but it just doesn't feel good to me. She weighed um, eight pounds, zero ounces. She was 20 inches long. So to me, quite a bit smaller than Lincoln, <laughs> but um, the story continues. So they wanted me to eventually get up. The epidural was already starting to wear off. I wasn't in pain, but they wanted me to get up if I could and go to the bathroom um, and see if I could pee on my own. Otherwise, they were going to cath me and I, they had another nurse come in to help my nurse get me up and get to, you know, a wheelchair, get to the bathroom. And I am sitting there and I was like, I can't pee. I just can't do it. And she's like, that's OK. And I said, no, I think it's because I'm passing out. And then I passed out on the toilet, <laughs> basically. And it was the smell of alcohol swabs that brought me back. So yay for my nurses for, you know, they were rock stars during that too. And Steve is the rock star for just, you know, chilling with Parker at that point. Um, eventually we were trans transferred to the postpartum unit. Um, Steve and I, 
are pretty much napping on and off at this point. Parker's sleeping and we were already enjoying like a lot of the differences between her birth and his birth like immensely. We were feeling a lot more optimistic. We knew there were hard times and things ahead of us, but it felt a lot better. Um, you know, Lincoln was born during the lockdown of the pandemic, very, very early in that time. There was so much stress and, and his birth was harder on me in general and it was my first, so that's hard. And I don't know, it was, there was just so many things that went better and our care seemed so much better. People were actually like interested in tracking her wet diapers and her poopy diapers and making sure that things were progressing for her and like with Lincoln we just didn't have that we even told them like he's not peeing he's not pooping I don't think he's getting anything from me and I know there's a lot of strong opinions about supplementing it wasn't until I supplemented Lincoln that one he actually finally did a little bit of sleep um, but two he did so much better his latch got better and we still ended up breastfeeding for six months and then I pumped for another two months after that before I called it and I was like I'm done um I wanted to do more breastfeeding with him at the six month mark but he didn't want me anymore <laughs> at that point which is fine so you know I, breastfeeding I think going into it this time I knew it didn't have to be all or nothing I knew I was going to be calmer I knew my milk was super delayed last time so I was already kind of prepared to supplement her if I needed to um I just wish like I wish it wasn't so all or nothing and it even to me was presented a bit all or nothing like we had a great lactation consultant come in she was wonderful really helped me look at the latch it was still kind of painful but she knew we were doing it right and we looked for tongue ties and there was nothing there so I felt great about that support and the second time we had a lactation person come in she was a little bit more like hey like the pacifier that's not a good idea hey like your milk was delayed last time like you really need to be doing this you might want to start pumping and I just didn't feel like any of that information was helpful but I felt confident in I guess ignoring it because um because I was a second time mom but had that information been given to me in that way the first time around that would have been really devastating to me and I just would have like went into second guess myself mold mode. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that no, nobody's perfect. Um, I don't expect anybody to be. It just seems like they're the messaging around like brand new moms and even new moms again, the second, third, fourth, fifth time. It's just fascinating to me the way things are presented in such um, blatant terms, at least in my experiences, right? So back to Parker, um, really throughout our time at the hospital, I felt like she was taking to breastfeeding well. We were swaddling her right away properly this time. I did learn how to hand express a little bit and I did it a couple times, um, which I do think maybe that also helped my milk come in, which was great because it came in like so much faster than, than before. Um, we had our pediatrician happen to be like the one on the rotations that Friday morning and he came in and said, she's looking great. No concerns. Her bilirubin, um, was following a pretty normal curve. So that was really good. And again, we were getting lots of good feedings in. I feel really, really lucky for that. And we got to go home, um, December 17th. So we went in, let's see, on the 15th, she was born on the 16th at 2 14 AM. Like I said, fast and furiously. And then on the 17th in the evening, we got to go home and I was ready at that point. Like Steve and I opted to basically keep the TV off and he had a really great playlist that we just kept listening to and enjoying and napping and eating. And, and mind you, this is my advice to anybody going into this, ask for stool softeners or Miralax or whatever you feel works best for you in that department get prune juice on every single tray you order from the hospital <laughs> just do it and then I had prune juice at home ready for me I am a big advocate for making sure that first bowel movement and actually all the subsequent ones subsequent ones um, are smooth and don't cause you more stress because um, it's it is scary you know going to the bathroom for the first time after birthing a human it is just like oh no nothing should be else coming out of me <laughs> so big advocate for that. Uh, I think the people on the meal service were like, oh, we know her. She's the one who's going to order prune juice at every, every tray. 
Um, so we enjoyed our time at the hospital. I was a little nervous coming home, but I felt really at peace with going home too. That night, my parents came by and brought Lincoln home. Um, he was a little curious, but more so he just missed us. Um, and really that night he got to love on us. Parker immediately took to sleeping on her back, which we are extremely blessed with because Lincoln never took to that really. Um, not for a really, really, really long time. Uh, we were swaddling properly. We just felt, we felt really good. And, you know, it was wonderful to see my parents that night and subsequent, oh my gosh, I can't say that word today, subsequent visitors after that. Um, we were already off to having some good snuggles with her, but also like snuggles and reading and singing with Lincoln, just like the night I had dropped him off at my parents. Um, like when he came home that night, like, he could he struggled a bit because it was different and you know it's like this is life changing to him not just us it's to him too and getting to read him books myself and snuggle and sing with him um that felt really good and we've really maintained that we give him like one-on-one -on -one attention um as able you know there are lots of things around the house that have to be done all the time and you, there's so many different ways to do this but for us what's worked well with Lincoln even though this is still such a huge adjustment for him is that he knows that like we are going to do one-on-one -on -one time with him and he really took to her well I would say his regression is in the way of like fighting bedtime fighting brushing teeth which isn't too abnormal for a toddler anyway um recently he's kind of taken to some different behavioral things that I think are just a part of this progression we'll go with the word progression into becoming a brother and becoming not the only baby in our lives so it's a huge change for him um and you know I wrote in my notes the last update I wrote here was on 12 21 so a couple days after her um, birth and her arrival is that I wrote, I'm afraid to say how good I think we are doing and how good I feel. I wrote, we had to bring Parker in for her first doctor's appointment on Monday and she, she did great. Afterwards, we even ran into Aldi. I went in and grabbed the things. Okay, y'all, I did push myself a bit too much in these early days, which I'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> but then I wrote the next day, we all played outside in the snow while Parker was sleeping. And although, of course, I would like more sleep, that is going well, too. I feel very lucky and blessed to be home and cozying up during this time. Because, mind you, this is right before, you know, the holidays and Christmas. And we did opt to do a lot more at home. We did get out of the house twice to go to my in-laws and then my parents' home. And even though that was lovely, it was a lot, right? You're very early postpartum and it was the most exhausting two days ever. And they were amazing days but exhausting. <laughs> so I was grateful to just cozy up after that and be like, yeah, if people want to come here, that's where I'll be. <laughs> I'll be healing. I'm healing all these stitches. I'm still spraying myself with dermoplast and like icing and stuff like that. So it was, yeah, it was so great to do this around the holidays. We were really lucky for that because afterwards we just cozied up. Um, and then winter kind of went away. Knock on wood, Michigan winter today, like as of today, um, it has been really, really mild and it has helped because we've gotten outside, even if it's just me stepping outside and walking around our backyard with a little bit with Lincoln while she's napping or, or anything else. Like it's just been nice to get that fresh air. I was a little nervous of how that was going to feel if it was super snowy, like, during her early days and I would never get outside so still feeling really good about that as of today um, some interesting things that have happened postpartum I think like I said I pushed things a little too fast because I was feeling so good I felt healed I felt like things were good downstairs um, unfortunately now I'm dealing with a bit of a prolapsing uterus I don't want to shy away from it because these are the things that can happen to people beyond even the first days postpartum beyond the first weeks um, I'm let's see I'm just about five weeks postpartum and this is just now happening so I'm pulling myself back on some of the things I was doing which to be honest wasn't much but it just might have been too much for my body so I'm trying to slow down doing my abdominal um, core um, rebuilding things for the diastasis recti, um, doing pelvic floor things. <sighs> Interestingly, I had called my doctor about this and they were kind of like, oh, can you go to the bathroom? Okay, well, 
we'll see you at your six week visit unless you really want to come in which coordinating that and all that I was like no like especially because it seems mild so I don't know we'll see <laughs> we'll see how that goes um, I just don't think there's a point to not sharing it because this is a normal thing that I know I'm not the first person to go through. Um, but this is just kind of speaking to how rushed um, people think we need to be healing and quote unquote bouncing back and um, getting into life and everything else. And so, you know, maybe I'll do a future episode about all the things we did to prepare. I did do an Instagram post about that, but um, the things in short to keep it short, the things I did to prepare for this birth were, um, well, a lot of mental and physical preparation, but also like home preparation. We're still just now starting to um, eat a lot more of the freezer meals, using more of our inventory foods and things like that because now Steve is back to work. He was able to get, you know, a couple weeks off, which was amazing and we are so blessed for that and I'm just... I'm also angry that like that's not the standard that like a lot of people don't get time off they don't get more than six weeks eight weeks 12 weeks like in this country it is so so dang sad <laughs> so that's my thought on that I don't want to get into it right now because this was her birth story that's that's what we're focusing on Parker Sue came into the world fast and furiously December 16th at 2 14 a.m. I am forever changed I'm forever grateful I now have a awesome toddler. He blows my mind every day. He runs around his sister saying, I gotta run around sister. I gotta run around sister. He'll hear her like cry a little bit and he'll say, sister sad, sister sad. He likes to try to help me put her down to sleep, help me undo her swaddle. He's been really adapting well. She's doing great. She's growing like crazy. We're already out of newborn clothes, which I'm happy for. She's so cute and so great, but man, I like, I'm excited for more toddler years. I just, I love toddler. I don't know why. I just, I love it. So that's my birth story with Parker. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we'll get back to, you know, more kitchen talk next week. I've got a lot of fun guests coming up this year in 2023 more things and more episodes to help you in the kitchen achieve your cooking and kitchen goals um, stay tuned for you know new content that will be coming in more to instagram as i get back into the swing of things i'm just very excited looking forward into 2023 and all of the goals i have for quarter one for quarter two you're probably going to see some more youtube things quarter three i think we're looking at a finished course we're looking at that and by looking is just kind of the ideas are there and just things are growing and I'm very excited. If you're listening and you are somebody in the Muskegon area though, I want you to know that in February, I'm going to be back to teaching in-person cooking classes at Needed Kitchens. That's K-N-E-A-D-E-D -E -E Kitchens. And if you go to their website or their Facebook page, they're in Muskegon, Michigan, near the Lakes Mall, right near the Starbucks that's over there. Um, I will be teaching a class every Saturday and because it's February, it'll be kind of focused on heart health, but with totally awesome recipes and just ways to make your recipes heart healthy if that's something you specifically need or are curious about. And honestly, they're just things that we all can do in general to enjoy our food and cook with like a little bit more intention in mind um, if you have some of those different conditions or you're concerned about that. So Either way, please check those out. Needed Kitchens. I will be there every Saturday in February teaching these cooking classes. And we hope to be doing that beyond all throughout the year 2023. So stay tuned on that. Check out their site. Sign up for the class right now. And I hope to meet you there. If you heard about the classes on this podcast, please let me know. And, uh, and check out their site and check out their store if you're in the area because... It's awesome. I, I have really enjoyed working with them, shopping there and being there. It's a great community space and the people there are so passionate about creating a sense of community and welcomeness. So I am over the moon to be partnering with them. I hope to see you in my Patreon community or over at Needed Kitchen soon. 
Thank you so much for listening to Parker Sue Holden's birth story. And I will see you all next week in the kitchen. Happy cooking, everybody.